Faith, George Michael, Need You Tonight, um, In Excess, Never Gonna Give You Up, Rick Astley, Heaven is a Place on Earth, Belinda Carlisle. I don't think I like would call any of them my jams. Not even Need You Tonight? No. Not even Faith? No. You gotta have Faith. True. Do you know what movie was number one when you were born? No. Beetlejuice! Beetlejuice! The number one movie the day you were born was Beetlejuice. Wow. That seems so appropriate. And the number one movie when I was born was Mr. Mom, which also stars Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton, just getting all those number ones for our birthdays. He did a lot of good work. So Beetlejuice came out when you were born. Ghostbusters came out around when I was born. And I think it's appropriate because I think that's like the difference in their special effects is like how we see movies. Well, we'll talk about if you think the effects in Beetlejuice are good, but Mm -hmm. Ghostbusters is like the limit because, yeah, a lot of it doesn't look great, but I can forgive everything that is as good as Ghostbusters or better Mm -hmm. because that's what special effects were in our lifetime. Wow. We've gone from like, yeah, so basic to space. So basic. Beetlejuice was crazy. (laughs) But we'll get into it on this, our podcast. It's called I Love This, (laughs) You Should Do. My name is Indy Striped Suit Randawa, and with me is Samantha Hees. Samantha Hees. Samantha Hees. Ah, She's here. It's me, <laughs> Samantha. She came bursting out of In the floor. In a cloud of glitter. Yeah. It's true. <laughs> How are you, Indy? Oh, I'm like the mayor of Sleepy Town. Yeah, I'm of actually sleepy town. very sleepy today, too. Yeah. I almost fell asleep on the train. We <laughs> should mention that... Our podcast, I Love This, You Should Too, is a member of the Alberta Podcast Network, which is locally grown and community supported. And we are so excited to be a part of it. And our first sponsor for today's episode is Rumi. And I think this is really helpful at this time of year because it's getting cold here. So if you have some cold drafts or even flickering lights or a leaky faucet, you might live in a haunted house. I don't think those are signs. I think that's just like maintenance. Oh. But if the floors are moving and the walls are bleeding, then get an exorcist. But if you just have drafty windows and some electrical issues, then you can contact Rumi and their Ask a Home Inspector service. So you can connect with certified professional home inspectors by phone or by a video call and get all of your questions answered. And Rumi will let you know what's easily fixable with some DIY or if you might need to call in a professional. Because I think that's the thing a lot of us worry about. If what can I fix and what do I really need to pay someone who's properly trained to fix? Hmm. Because I keep trying to fix things by myself. Not always a good idea. Like when I used a glue gun to stick on the bathroom fan vent. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But you can do that by yourself, but that's just a bad choice. It's a bad choice, I know. But if you visit Rumi at R-U-M-I dot C-A and book a Ask a Home Inspector appointment, they will let you know what's a good idea and what's a bad idea. So you can contact Rumi at R-U-M-I dot C-A. Well, Indy, what are we doing here today? Today we are talking about Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice? From 1988. I'm not going to say it a third time because, you know, things are going to come. Right. So I said that I had loved this movie growing up. It really had a big influence on me, I think, because this movie is really like a gateway into horror for children. And uh, 80s and 90s children were allowed to watch horror things. Not so much anymore, but in my day. (laughs) In your day. (laughs) In my day in the mid-90s, you could just watch any scary movie you wanted Hmm. with your parents' blockbuster card. I love that you just had free reign with the blockbuster card. Yeah. And nobody at Blockbuster, like, questioned you for taking out movies? Well, I think... uh, Initially, they would call home and say, like, is he allowed to take out this R-rated movie? Uh, there's a 10-year-old here who wants to rent Superfly. <laughs> and But then after my parents gave the go-ahead of, like, yeah, he can rent whatever, then it was just on there. So if I had the card, I could just rent whatever. Wow. Fancy. It was pretty good. It was good times. Good times. <laughs> so I grew up really loving Beetlejuice and having it just always be a, like, part of, uh, like, movies that I had seen. It was never something 
I can't remember a time where I wasn't familiar with it. Oh. So I'm really excited to hear what you think about it, and especially seeing it so many years after it was made. Mm. So, Samantha, we watched Beetlejuice. I still love it. I noticed a lot of different things than maybe I picked up on as a kid, but I love it. Do you? It was a solid 7 out of 10 for me. I'll take that. Yeah. Because I feel like it's quite a departure from things that you normally like to watch. Yeah. So I think a seven is pretty good. Yeah. It was uh, It was less zany than that trailer. Yes. That trailer made it look like it was crazy town. Well, because the trailer had all the Beetlejuice moments. Mm-hmm. And Beetlejuice, I think, is in this movie for about 16, 17 minutes. Yeah, he's like 30% of the movie. 20, 10. One of those, yeah. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, I thought that he'd be in the movie more, but, like, I'm kind of happy he wasn't. Because it's such a, like, big character. Mm -hmm. You can't have him in there all the time or else it would be super annoying, like the genie in Aladdin. Yes. I know this is one of the big things that nobody agrees with me on. I don't like Robin Williams. I don't think he's funny. I like him when he's serious. He's quite good. He is a very good serious actor. But, But, yeah, I think he was, it was, like, too zany. Just him being himself robin williams is too zany yes agreed yeah and beetlejuice is as well i do like michael keaton's performance but it's good that he's not there all the time because Mm -hmm. you can't sustain that kind of energy or maybe he can the film cannot no and i enjoyed the little like family moments that they had Mm -hmm. um throughout the movie so it was nice to have beetlejuice there sometimes but not all the time So what else did you like about this movie? I like the difference between Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis and the Dietzes. Mm -hmm. Because they were like kind of opposite ends of the scale. Um, And uh, I really enjoyed Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis together. They were really sweet. Yeah. Alec Baldwin looks like Ryan Gosling now. Oh, you know what? I never would have thought that. But when you mention it. Baldwin in this has a similar, He's like, the jaw. That, and, like, the eyes. Yeah. yeah he is pretty Gosling-like. Or yeah. Or I guess Gosling is pretty Baldwin-ish. True. I Baldwin-esque. Guess. Baldwin-esque. <laughs> uh, I had to keep reminding myself that it wasn't Ryan Gosling and that it was Alec Baldwin. That's funny. I guess because I had seen movies with young Alec Baldwin, that's already a set person in mm. my mind. But I guess if you only know current Alec Baldwin, yeah. then you see this. He looks more like Ryan Gosling than he does current Alec Baldwin. Yeah. Yeah. So I I don't think I've ever seen a young Alec Baldwin movie. Well, maybe this will just be the first of many. <laughs> it's the gateway to Baldwin-ing. <laughs> to Hunt for the Red October. But I really enjoyed their relationship and they were like really sweet to watch. Yeah. It's funny that we get like such a, a sweet couple in this like, really bizarre movie. Yeah. It has a lot of extremes in it. It does. It does. And um, I was kind of like thrown off by the beginning of the movie because I was like, this is just like a nice romance movie, kind of a yeah. boring romance movie. <laughs> and then they die and then things start to get crazy. But I uh, was like not expecting the beginning of the movie. Yeah, based on the trailer that you had seen especially. Which is all like boing and like car horn sounds. Well, let's get into Beetlejuice. It came out in 1988, and I think it was just Tim Burton's second feature. Hmm. He had done Pee-wee's Big Adventure before then. Have you ever seen that? No. It's similar in a lot of ways that it's kind of like a family-friendly movie, but it is creepy and weird at the same time. That movie scared me a lot as a kid. Oh. Large Marge really scared me. Interesting. It sounds scary. Pee-wee's Big Adventure? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And then he did Beetlejuice. He'd done some shorts before as well. And then after Beetlejuice, really on the strength of this movie, he got Batman. And that's huge. With Michael Keaton. Yeah. So then he brought Michael Keaton along with him. And at the time, everyone thought like... You can't have this guy be Batman because Michael Keaton, well, he looks like Michael Keaton, right? He doesn't exactly command a superhero presence. And that's not like a slight on him. I think he's he's one of my favorite actors, especially when I was a kid. 
but he was great in Batman, and I loved that. And that was probably my favorite movie when I was five years old when it came out. <laughs> he then went on to do Edward Scissorhands, Batman Returns, Ed Wood, and I think that's kind of the golden era of Tim Burton in my mind. I think he does do some more good stuff in the next little while when it was Mars Attacks, Sleepy Hollow, Big Fish, even Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. But after that, I really start losing him when he gets into Alice in Wonderland, Dark Shadows, Big Eyes. I haven't seen his version of Dumbo, but I hear it's interesting. I heard it was terrifying. Yeah. But that's good because he should be terrifying again, not just like... Hey, here's a wacky guy. I got Johnny Depp in a big hat and dark eye makeup. So (laughs) that's kind of all his movies were for a while there. But now that you've seen Edward Scissorhands, which we did cover on this podcast. So go back to our early ones if you want to hear all about that. And you've seen Beetlejuice. Yes. What do you think about Tim Burton? Um, Tim Burton is someone that I always knew of. But you kind of knew him from the time where I don't care for him as much. Yes. Um, like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and later like Alice in Wonderland and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But um, I really enjoyed his Alice in Wonderland. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I hated think it, it. it might have been more the costumes in the set than the acting. Mm-hmm. But I really enjoyed the like cool, like darker take on it. I didn't because it just seemed like someone doing a Tim Burton impression but doing it poorly. Mm -hmm. It seems like a 16-year-old kid who's watched Nightmare Before Christmas too many times and is like, what if it's Alice in Wonderland? But it's a little crazy. It's like, (laughs) it's already Alice in Wonderland. It is crazy. You don't need to like (laughs) try so hard. It it really tried very hard. Mm -hmm. And I find like the creepiness, the truly bizarre weirdness of Beetlejuice. Right feels effortless it's not someone who's going like i'm gonna shake up hollywood with my crazy style it's someone who's like this is what i think is cool Mm -hmm. and this is what i think is interesting and i'm gonna share it with the world because this is who i am it felt more authentic i guess when he was younger i can see that i can see that for sure he's not as hollywood in this movie no this movie uh, outside of the cast is definitely not hollywood the story is is bizarre i think it does rely on a lot of story structure that is well established but it's a, it's a strange movie tonally and visually and the performances as well but i i really love how strange it is and i feel <laughs> like movies this weird don't get big studio releases anymore true um i really enjoyed the look of the movie um that house was so cool Mm -hmm. and like the even when um the mom redid it when Catherine o'hara redid it it was still like so cool and almost like a dollhouse yeah kind of like their little doll village but house sized Well, let's talk about the visuals then to start off. Sure. So what about the special effects? They are clearly different than what we see today. But let's talk first off about kind of the stop motion things like when they would pull off their faces or stretch them out, that kind of stuff. Does it seem dated and old to you? Because Um, this is your first time watching it. It does a little bit. Um, You can definitely tell that they're like pushing the boundaries of what special effects could do at the time. Mm -hmm. And so some of it, um, like when they're turning into the corpses at the end, it's like CGI'd over his face because as he's turning into a corpse. Oh, I don't know if it was oh it looked like it was just like transposed over his face it may have been that not okay like i don't think there was actual computers used. oh okay okay so I, yes that's there, what i meant though yeah. like it it didn't it wasn't real makeup but it also just kind of looked like like almost like an overhead projector it may very well have been a projector <laughs> yeah um because uh Barbara's already turned into the, like, corpse bride. Mm-hmm. and uh, Corpse bride, another Tim Burton movie. Yes. Um, and Adam is, like, slowly turning into, and so he's got, like, basically the image of what's already on Barbara's face, like, transposed onto his face, and it wasn't quite as, like, realistic. That kind of broke the, like, whole scene for me. 
I don't even recall that. Really? I guess I never look at him. I was looking at her makeup, which I thought was it very was good. very good. Yeah. Some of the special effects makeup is really really good in this. They did win an Oscar for best makeup I'm for not, this. I'm not surprised. And you know who it was? V Neil. Who's V Neil? We watched a TV show called Face Off recently, which I always watched <gasps> right! when it was when it was new, but Samantha had never seen it. And every season they do a Beetlejuice kind of inspired it's a makeup show it's a makeup mm-hmm. challenge show and Neal was one of the hosts that's so cool i did not realize that i still love the stop motion effects in this because i feel like they're so strange that they don't feel dated mm-hmm. it just feels like it belongs in beetlejuice because everything in here is really weird that the stop motion effect, instead of having something that looks very realistic done with CG or whatever, Mm -hmm. this seems more appropriate. And because of that, doesn't look dated. Right. But when they go into like the nether realm with the sandworms and stuff, that clearly looks dated because we do those same techniques now and much better. Yeah. But the effects with the stop motion, we don't really do those anymore, so it doesn't get the chance to look dated. Because right. It's not like, like we haven't you're... updated the technology. Yeah, you're not seeing new movies with stop motion makeup. No. That's just not a thing you see, right? Yeah. That was yeah, it was kinda neat to see some of these older techniques that, like you said, we haven't updated or changed technology for. So some things That were not new to me, but, like, I hadn't seen very much. Yeah, and a lot of those techniques you see in a lot of older movies from, like, the 50s and 60s. And for stop motion, this is kind of the peak of a lot of it, really, right? Mm -hmm. Because nobody kept doing it after this. (laughs) Yeah. Except for, like, full stop motion movies. Yes. And then the makeup, I think, is especially great, of course, in the waiting room scenes. Mm -hmm. I loved all of the... The characters in there. Did you have a favorite one? Um, I think the receptionist. Oh yeah, Miss Argentina. She's yeah. I think she's everyone's favorite. I she's so the, good. She's so colorful and yeah, and she was funny too. I enjoyed some of her little like quips. Her delivery is very good. Yeah. I liked her a lot. And I like that they carry a joke through like the entire time. Which one do you mean? Uh, the, like, if you commit suicide, you become a civil servant. Yeah, the kind of referenced once, I think. Later in the movie. And And then it turns out to be kind of true. Yeah, because I was like, how do you end up working in, like, purgatory? That's, now you know. Now I know. And you find out later. But, um, I liked some of the, like, little bit parts that were in the waiting room from time to time. I didn't stop and look at all of the side characters as much when I was watching it as a kid but now Mm -hmm. I got a chance to look at all of them and there is such a story built in to all of of the makeup yeah right like there's the one guy with the chicken bone or whatever bone sticking through his throat so you know how he died the guy with the shark on the leg the smoking one is really good I like that guy that's all burnt up and of course the, the shrunken head guy yeah which is funny I love when he just turns his head like, that makes me laugh. Yeah. yeah. It's some of the mannerisms and, like, when he's being a little creepy to Gina Davis, yeah, in the waiting room. And mm-hmm. she's, like, kind of leaning away from him. Yeah. It was little things like that where, like, they don't say anything, but, like, the body acting is there. And I love when Miss Argentina says, like, well, if I had known that, I wouldn't have had my little accident. Yeah. And it's kind of a joke, but also, like, real sad. That is super sad, yeah. I also liked the, uh, what I assume is a magician's assistant. Oh, yes. Yeah, so who's been cut, cut in, in half. half. Yeah, that's really good. And the good. legs are separate from her torso. Yeah. I thought that was super funny. That was. It was a trick that went wrong, right? Yeah. And now she's here. Yeah, see, each one of those has a story. Yeah. And you can tell the story just by looking at them. And I think that is an example of some real good makeup. That would be probably really fun to like act as well because you can get really into like your backstory. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Without like it really mattering. So nobody else really gets input on it except for the makeup. True. But sure, it doesn't matter to us now. But we're saying that after the fact. I think that all that backstory did matter when they were designing the makeup. Mm, Because I'm sure that they had a plan of this person died from this, doing this. This is their whole life story. Right. And sure, it doesn't matter if the actor plays to all of that all the time. But I think 
creating the makeup with all of that in mind does matter in a way. Mm -hmm. Because sure, we might not get all of it, but it really informs and directs what they're doing. So it doesn't just seem like, oh, and here's some creepy guy, right? It seems specific. And we're talking about each one of those characters, right? So I guess it worked quite well. Yeah, for sure. I uh, They definitely stuck with me, too, because we watched this like a couple nights ago. And I've definitely been thinking about some of those characters since. Yeah. And now on Halloween, when you go out and you'll see like a greenish woman with a Miss Argentina sash, you'll get it. <laughs> because I always see one every Halloween. I kind of want to be her for Halloween. Well, I have a Beetlejuice costume. We could be a set. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Although it's not like we're going to be going anywhere. <laughs> no, but still, we'll appreciate it. We will. It'll be great. And then back on to the visuals. Of course, we're talking about Tim Burton, so I have to talk about German Expressionism. It is very much at play here. Even in the Dietz's redesign of the house, we get some of those off-kilter angles. And then especially when Beetlejuice comes out later, I love how all of the angles of like the fireplace and doors and everything, they're all askew. Mm -hmm. And when you go into the afterlife as well, not just in the waiting room, but when they have to like walk down the hall, all of the angles are all weird. Yeah. It's straight out of Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. But it's like Caligari mixed with a carnival. Yes. Right? It's like a funhouse mirror kind of effect. Yeah. And I think that's probably pretty intentional too, because it's a like a mirror, but it's a skewed version of all of the things you're used to. And that's just a little more disorienting to have something that you're used to and have it be strange and not quite right than having something that's completely new. Hmm. Did the house grow when the Dietzes moved in? Kind of. Like, it, I don't think it makes sense, with all of the space, but it was a big house to begin with. But then they add on some of the outside stuff, but it's it's a set, so I don't think they really followed the rules too much. Right. Because it just the house seemed to get bigger and grander when they moved in. Yeah. Even, yeah. Whereas when I, like, before they move in, it seems like such a cozy home, mm -hmm. almost. So... Like, I definitely felt like it grew and everything got kind of larger than life like them. Yeah. And I think that's clearly intentional that yeah. they were trying to show the effect that these people have on their environment because you're kind of seeing the world through their eyes when whoever's decorating it, we're seeing their take on the world. Mm -hmm. And those two always have kind of competing styles when the Maitlands, the Gina Davis and Alec Baldwin, they're kind of that like Cape Cod and like. I think it's in New England, Connecticut, this is taking place yes, in. Yes, yeah. And then when the Dietzes come, it's all postmodernism and Memphis style. Yeah. Oh, I hate that Memphis look. It's the worst. <laughs> Memphis design, not from Memphis. It's from Italy. Oh, interesting. It was from the, a design or architecture firm called the Memphis Group. Weird. Um, one thing funny, like side anecdote is that, um, I was looking for another Halloween cross stitch to do and I found a handbook for the recently deceased cross stitch Oh, and I, I didn't, I didn't get it. I saved it, but I didn't get it. But I was like, I wouldn't have known what that was if I'd found it last week. Yeah. You just be like, oh, some cool book. Some cool book. And now I'm like, oh, maybe I do kind of want to do that. <laughs> Let's talk about the characters and performances in this movie. Sure. Who would you say is the protagonist of Beetlejuice? Maybe Barbara and Adam? It's maybe for the first half, but it kind of turns into Lydia's movie in my mind. Does Winona it? Winona Ryder. No? No, I kind of felt like she was supporting. I think the second half is mostly about her journey hmm. than it, more than it is the Maitlands. But let's talk about all of them. Let's start with uh, Charles. Mm -hmm. The Charles Dietz, the dad, played by Jeffrey Jones, who now anything, all anyone talks about about him is his arrests for child pornography. But let's not go into all of that because that's not what it's about right now. Oh, yikes. I just <laughs> clicked on his Wikipedia page. And that's what you get, <laughs> that's right? That's the first thing that comes up. Yeah. yeah. Yikes. Uh, the other thing people will know him from is Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And he's kind of one of those actors to me, at least, where I'm like, oh, you know that one guy? He was in Beetlejuice and Ferris Bueller's Day Off, but I can never remember his name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's got a very, uh, like, classic actory face. 
Oh, I would disagree quite a bit, but maybe we have different ideas of what a classic actor is. <laughs> I think of like Clark Gable. Oh. You think of Jeffrey Jones. Well, like he's more like charactery. Yeah, like, he's a he's, character. He's actor, not for sure. like Clark Gable, who's like classically handsome and is like always going to be suave, debonair, handsome guy. Yeah. It, he's more like able to play characters, so he looks like kind of a, a character actor. Yeah, Actory I always thought guy. he looks kind of Weasley. He does kind of look Weasley. <laughs> but he is a real estate developer, and we get the impression that he had some sort of nervous breakdown in New mm-hmm. York, and now he's here to relax. And I like the scenes early on when they're moving in, and he's sitting there in his chair, and he's like, oh, this is my study. And he's shaking his leg and drumming his fingers, like, yeah. I'm relaxed already. And yeah. he's clearly not. He's clearly one of those people who would work until they were 90 because he's, like, not able to slow down. Probably. Yeah. yeah. And I love how much he puts up with Delia and how he's like, just give me this one space. That's all I need. I just need this one room. <laughs> <laughs> Should we talk about Catherine O'Hara? Let's. I love her. And also, you can see like early Moira Rose. Absolutely. There are so many lines in this that could have just been Moira. I need to see more Catherine O'Hara stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, And just see like, because I feel like she mishmashed all of the parts that she's played into Moira. I feel like more than anything, it's Delia, but with a bit of Otho mixed in. What's Otho? Oh, we'll talk about Otho in a bit. He's the the guy who's kind of the he's like a bigger dude who's Oh right, right, right. Yeah. The one who steals the handbook. Yes. Yeah. That right? it's yeah. Otho and Delia kind of makes Moira. Yeah, yeah, you're right. That's that's yeah. And in case you're not familiar, we're talking about Moira Rose that Catherine O'Hara played in Schitt's Creek, which was a great performance and so late in her career, maybe her best. Yeah, I so I agree. I don't know. Think that I've seen a lot of Catherine O'Hara recently, but I definitely think this is like the best. I think so too. Like she does a lot of good work with Christopher Guest as well, mm-hmm. and Eugene Levy's usually in those oh. with her. I just want them to be married in real life. Yeah, really, they should be. A couple. I always forget that Eugene Levy like has a wife. Yeah. Do you know Catherine O'Hara's husband? No. I believe, I'm not sure about this, but I believe it's the uh, d- set designer that she met on the set of Beetlejuice. Huh. Um, Bo Welch? Yeah, Bo Welch is a great set designer. Because if you're doing set design for Tim Burton, set design is as big as any actor's performance. Yeah. His sets set up everything, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, Bo Welch has done quite a few of them, I believe. And this one was maybe his best work. Hmm. Uh, They did meet on Beetlejuice and they fell in love. I like that. Um, I love Catherine O'Hara. So we could just talk about her all day. Did you have a favorite part of her performance in this movie? Um, When she does the song and dance. Yeah. Well, it's such a good scene. And then at the end when she scares uh, her husband with the like statue thing and she's like he loves it yeah. <laughs> and walks away my favorite was her most moira line perhaps when she goes i'm going to go crazy and i'm taking you all with me <laughs> <I> yeah <laughs> love that. yeah there was definitely some moments where i'm like i could imagine her saying that to like alexis and david and then her costuming as well yes was not quite what moira does but in a similar vein of its eccentricities right her costume now is like before Moira became big time. Her costuming in Beetlejuice. In Beetlejuice. Yeah. Is because it's like not quite as like maybe high fashion. Well, or like... I think it's just 88 oh, sure. is a, what a lot of it is. But yeah, it doesn't seem to be about the brand names. It's more eccentric and homemade. Yes. Do you remember? I think it's in the moving in scene when the dad is wearing a red sweater Okay. Later on in the movie, Catherine O'Hara is wearing that as pants. Really? Yeah, it's the I swear it's the same sweater. And she has like suspenders on it to keep it up. Oh. I didn't notice that. And there's also gloves that she then later turns into a headband. 
Yeah, I guess headband, but it's wrapped on her head, but you can see the fingers kind of coming down. Okay, so I saw that and I was wondering what it was, but I was like, ugh. Gloves. 80s. <laughs> yeah, it was the 80s. That's what it yeah, was. Yeah, I was like, meh. It's, you know, wild, wacky 80s fashion. So then let's talk about Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis as the Maitlands, because I feel like their performances are just so linked. Mm-hmm. I don't even know how to talk about them separately because they kind of behave as one character. And they're, yeah, they're always together. Mm-hmm. And they're never in conflict. No. And I love like how in love they are at the beginning. Like remember yeah. that bit about them like trying to get up to answer the door and the other pulling them down and kissing them more? And how excited they are to not go anywhere on vacation. And they're up at six in the morning, Mm -hmm. excited on their vacation, just to like be together and do things. Yeah. It was, yeah, it's It's really cute. It's so cute. cute. Um, I liked how uh, the only person that they were mean to was, and they weren't even mean, but the only person that they were like kind of against was their cousin or her cousin. Oh, Jane. Yeah. The realtor. Yeah. I didn't realize that was her cousin. That's what it said in the write-up. Oh, I, I just thought it was a real estate agent. But yeah. that makes more sense because she does come by after they die as well. Yes. Yeah, it says uh, Barbara's pushy cousin. Oh. Yeah. I never noticed that. Um, but yeah, that also explains some of the, like, dynamic. Yeah, like, it she seems... she kind of pushes ooh. her way into the house. Yeah. And she, like, f- seems very at home for someone who's trying to sell the house out from under them. Mm -hmm. And did he catch the bit about the children? Yes, yeah. There's just like one line, and that's the only thing that hints on it, Yeah, is when the cousin, apparently, I thought realtor, says, well, this really should be a place for a family. And then you just see the look on Gina Davis's face. Such good acting. What do you think happened there? I think she had a miscarriage. I think so as well. Yeah. Because then in the car later, um, he's like, oh, maybe on this vacation we can try again. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's either that they can't have a child or it kind of seemed to me like they lost a child. Yeah. Which is sad. It's like a little tinge of sadness right at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. But then you also feel really good because they're clearly like still in love and like enjoying their life. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I think that kind of leads into our maybe last of the main characters at least so they can't have a child or perhaps they lost one and Mm -hmm. that's kind of the only sadness really they have in their lives because it seems like everything's going great for them it's true he has that hardware store i think and she i'm not sure what she does she's just happy we know that maybe they work at the hardware store together that's probably the case that makes sense yeah yeah they totally would have a job where they spend all day together as well right but um, so they lost a child and then we get introduced to Lydia and Lydia never really had any parental figures. And by the end of the movie, they both had the two things that they mm-hmm. had lost, right? Because they won a child and now they're dead, so they can't. But they do kind of adopt Lydia because yeah. her parents are terrible. Her parents clearly just don't really want anything to do with Lydia or they don't get her. So they yeah. stopped trying to parent her. Mm-hmm. But then uh, the actual parents in this movie, <laughs> uh, the Maitlands, are like, well, like, care for you and they study for tests with her and then she seems so much more like well adjusted at the end of the movie yeah even really early on when she has that line about she can see ghosts because she herself is strange and unusual (laughs) and i love the delivery of that it was so good but gina davis's reaction to that is like you look like a normal girl to me yeah i mean she just doesn't see any difference the maitlands in general don't get put off by outward shows yeah. as much they are able to see things as they are yeah for sure and they can kind of cut through a lot of the like facade that Lydia is putting up mm-hmm. so what do you think about Winona Ryder in this I liked her um I didn't realize she was this young in this movie I thought she was much older yeah, so I think she was probably around 17-ish when this came out. Hmm. And this this was her big break because after this, then she got Heathers. Do you ever see Heathers? No. 
I think you might like it because it's weird and dark that I would like, but it's high school girls. It's it was like a Mean Girls of the eighties. Maybe we ways. should do another like burlesque of like I should have probably seen this already. Yeah, Heather's is. is <laughs> and we very should watch good. Heather's because yeah, I I know it's always been kind of on my radar, but I've never actually seen it. Yeah, and then two years after this, she was in Edward Scissorhands, right. and then after that, she's a star and doing big budget stuff after that. And kind of still is. Yeah, true. Um, I like her. I like her as an actor. She does a really good job of playing the character uh, of Lydia. And uh, it's believable. It's not like some poppy Hollywood girl trying to be goth. Yeah. It seems very appropriate for her. And I don't know what Winona Ryder is like in real life, but it seemed like it would be believable for her to be this goth person in real life yeah definitely and i'm sure uh young kids all over the world had huge crushes on goth winona rider at this time <laughs> i couldn't get past her bangs <laughs> yeah the pointy bangs oh. but i like that this was clearly a goth written by a goth mm-hmm. because i think any depictions of people who were dressed like this earlier in film are kind of sullen and like more mean spirited. Right. And I guess you could say that she is a little sullen and kind of absorbed in her own mm-hmm. world. That's true. But it kind of seems like she's looking into all of this. Uh, she could, has a preoccupation with death, but also we don't know what happened to her mother. I imagine she died. Mm-hmm. Maybe they're just divorced, but I don't know. It kind of makes sense to me if, both the Maitlands and Lydia have lost someone and they kind of have a bond with the afterlife even before it gets introduced into the movie so directly. Yeah, that makes sense. I uh, I like that. Yeah, because it just says that um, Lydia is uh, Jeffrey Jones's daughter from his first marriage. They don't actually explain. Yeah, there's just a line where someone says mother and she says stepmother. Stepmother. Yeah. But I like that the goth in this is just a sensitive artist type, like how Tim Burton probably saw himself. Mm-hmm. And you'll that's pretty clear in all of his movies that he's kind of at his best when he's sell, telling a story that's about some version of what he thinks he himself is. Mm, yeah. Whether it's uh, Edward Scissorhands, Ed Wood, Jack Skellington, they're all characters who are not quite right for the world they live in Mm. but it's all right because they have this like childlike innocence or wonder and uh, a different way of looking at things that everyone else will eventually learn from right which i'm pretty sure is just tim burton going like see all you guys who beat me up in high school cool look at this there's a place for me yeah 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 and in this case though i don't think lydia is is that character exactly like you could make the argument that Beetlejuice is like the weirdo in this that he has mm-hmm. in every movie, but Beetlejuice doesn't really have the heart, of course, that all of your Edward Scissorhands and Jack Skellington right. and everyone does. But Lydia, rather than, oh, wait, I think I just figured it out, and I think I might have my thesis for this when I wrap everything up at the <laughs> end. So, yeah, because now that I think about it, because all of those characters are somewhat childlike in their innocence, Lydia is the opposite, right? She's precocious. She's more worldly than pretty much everyone in this movie. Mm-hmm. Or at least she has a, a a maturity about her. She is less likely to jump to conclusions. She is more evidence-based, I think, than most of the people in this movie. She has a very mature way of thinking of things. So that kind of doesn't fit with what Burton usually does. But then when you look at it, all of her growth, if you could call it that, because she's still pretty much the same character at the end. Right. But all of the changes that she goes through are not to make her grow up faster. As you get from, like most ghost stories are often a stand-in for puberty a lot of the time. There's Mm -hmm. a reason that most of those movies, whether it's Exorcist, Or so many others have girls who are right around that age. And going through the haunting is kind of a uh, symbolic way of them becoming a woman in Mm -hmm. in a lot of different ways. Like Exorcist, it's very clear in that. But I think a lot of other ones work that way as well. But since this is like a reverse haunting, 
And I think um, while we talk about other characters, <laughs> I'm going to process this. So I'm going to have a big thing at the end. Okay. But this is a reverse haunting movie. It has all of the same beats as a haunted house movie. But rather than the ghosts being the bad ones, it's mm-hmm. like the people who come in and take over from the ghosts and are, are the villains. The house, yeah. They're the ones haunting. So then it stands to reason that this is not a story about her becoming more mature, becoming a woman, but rather it's a story about her regaining some of that innocence, mm-hmm. right? Because she doesn't get that with her parents. She's forced to be an adult because she doesn't have any parental figures. Right. But now she gets the parents with the Maitlands and she's again able to recapture her childhood. It's a reverse haunting. Oh, that's really good. I didn't realize how clever that was. But that's, that seems like it makes sense, right? I really like that, yeah. And I agree with you. Because, yeah, even in the trailer, they're like, humans are haunting our house. They're like, the living are haunting our house. Well, yeah, Beetlejuice is a bio-exorcist. Which I think is hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> And because when when we get her at the end, she's still like gothed up, right? But she's in her school uniform. And I think it's a very conscious choice to make it a school uniform and not have her just be in her normal goth clothes. Yes. By putting her in that, even though it's something she has to wear, Burton at least has chosen to put her in that. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of the influence of both of her new parents. Mm-hmm. Because, like, the plaid is what uh, Alec Baldwin is always wearing on her skirt. Right. And then she's wearing a white shirt that's kind of bright like Gina Davis wears. Mm-hmm. So she hasn't changed who she is. Because I think if you put her in street clothes but have her be all bright, she's changed who she fundamentally is. Yes. And I think that wouldn't be a good message either. Because it's saying, like, well, there was something wrong with you before. Mm-hmm. But if you put her in her same clothes, we might not get... That she has undergone some sort of change? Yes. And in her new clothes at the end of the movie, she looks more cared for. Because at the beginning, she's like kind of ratty goth. Oh, I thought she looked lovely, but I get what you're saying. But like she looks a little bit more unkempt. Whereas in the end of the movie, she's riding her bike and her hair is combed. And I think she just looks happier is the biggest thing. True, true. But her hair looks like washed and combed. <laughs> like someone was like, Lydia, go have your shower before bed. <laughs> but her goth hair, and I'm sure all you Flock of Seagulls fans out there know, actually probably took a lot more work than her, her <laughs> later hair. Probably. But she does look more cared for at the end of the movie. And I think that's like... A very clear sign of the fact that, like, the balance in the house is kind of restored. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have any favorite bits uh, with her? I liked her dress at the wedding. Oh, the red wedding dress? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I liked all of her little moments, like, when she's trying to pick the lock to the attic and... Like, she looked like a little kid when she was doing that. Mm -hmm. She does a very good job of still having that childlike wonder and innocence. Mm -hmm. I think my favorite line of hers is when her dad was talking about building her a dark room in the basement. And she says, my life is a dark room. I love that. That was very good. And you can tell those are like the moments where the dad's like, how are you, my child? Like, I don't know what to do with you at all and i like those because tim burton who is like clearly that goth kid still has like a sense of humor about it he's not taking himself so seriously Mm -hmm. like i feel like he does in his later works i one thing i liked about the deets family is that um the dad doesn't like try and put her in frilly dresses Mm -hmm. like the dad and um delia aren't like oh, put that pink dress on we bought you. Or, like, stop being so weird dressing and you're all black. Like, put some color on. Like, they're kind of just letting her be. Yeah, one of the things they do provide her with is freedom. But Mm -hmm. perhaps she needs a little more structure in her life. But they do let her just be herself. Yes, and I like that because then that allows, like, and she clearly needs structure. But, like, it allows for the Meatlands to become pseudo parents yeah well i guess we never talked about beetlejuice himself right how did you like michael keaton as beetlejuice (laughs) uh like we were saying um at the beginning of the episode it's he's a very large larger than life character Mm -hmm. and i am glad they only put the amount of him in that they did yeah because it would have just been too much and it would have taken away from like the 
strength of the other characters. Yeah, definitely. Because basically then everyone's just a supporting actor. Yeah, because if he's in the scene, he's commanding everything. Yeah. And all the other people are doing is kind of reacting to it, really. Yes. So I liked that he was only in a little bit of the movie. What do you said, like 16 or 17 minutes of the movie? Something like that. I li- I appreciated that Tim Burton did that, even though like I'm sure the urge is to show off the monster you made, right? Like mm-hmm. To like be like, no, it's like all about this. And because it's called Beetlejuice, I assume that he would have been in the movie way more than he was. But I liked two things about him. I liked his whole demeanor of how Michael Keaton acted him. And then I also liked that there was, like, a way to get rid of him. Yes. Um, I feel like a lot of, like, the Marvel movies and stuff, there's no real way to quell some of these, like, evil things other than killing them. Mm-hmm. You can't subdue them temporarily, which you could with Beetlejuice. And I liked that because it gave the movie a chance to like move forward without it needing to be like the climax in the end. Yeah, it was a really helpful script mm-hmm. contrivance, really. But yeah, just to have that built in, it's an easy way to get out of those scenes. Yes, right? because then it could very well have been like one hour at the beginning of the movie with no Beetlejuice and then an hour at the end with all Beetlejuice. Yeah. Um, so it was neat to be able to like have a concrete way to put him aside for a minute. I do really like his performance, but yeah, like you were saying, it's a good amount of that. Mm-hmm. And I think he's kind of uh, like with all real horror movies, I think they're at their best when you barely see the thing you're scared of. Mm-hmm. And I think that works well for Beetlejuice as well. Just enough to get all of that but you don't need to have him there all the time because it gets less effective the more you see of him yeah it's like the shark in jaws or ghosts in haunted house movies when you see them you're like oh well that's disappointing yeah i enjoyed his zaniness (laughs) i give him props for that because he is like a fully fleshed out character I, again, don't read many things, but I read something that was new and people are saying, like, well, you can't have this character because he's, like, sexually harassing people. And I was like, yeah, but he's the villain. If he did those things and then we are led to believe, like, cool. Yeah, that guy's a cool guy. Yeah, that would be one thing. Glorifying. He's, like, pretty much a devil. Yeah, he's a creep. Yeah. He's meant to be a creep. And so, yeah, when he's doing all of that, he is literally just being a creep. Yeah. And they say he is, and everyone says, like, yeah, he's the worst. Try to get rid of him. And then he gets eaten up by a sandworm. So, yeah, it, yeah it makes sense. I was excited when that happened. That's one criticism I do have of this movie. It's very deus ex machina, where the end just, you're raising your eyebrow. I don't know what Uh, that means. That term uh, (laughs) literally means God from the machine, but it's just a term in uh, literature or in movies where the ending comes about kind of out of nothing. Mm. Like in this case, she just rides a sandworm out of the sky. (laughs) How did she learn how to ride it? How did it come from the ceiling? I don't know. Yeah. But you don't think about it, right? Because it's just like, yeah, sure, he's gone. He got eaten by a sandworm at the end. Because it, like, it's rated, like, that height of everything being really crazy and yeah. loud and everything. And then all of a sudden he gets eaten. And then it's just, like... Now he's gone. Everyone's, like, looking around, like, is he going to come back? And then he's dead. Yeah. Yeah, so it doesn't really make sense. But, well, you know what? None of this really no. makes sense. But it's not a movie that that stops me from from loving it, right? Because it, yeah. it kind of just doesn't really care about that. It was, like, a fun way to end something that was just, like totally out of out yeah. there and if they had made rules of like hey this is what a sandworm does and then broke it then i would be upset about it but it doesn't really take any of that into consideration it's just yeah. here's a bunch of crazy stuff a lot of it's pretty cool <laughs> yeah you don't really like there it's not like marvel where they send 17 movies like building the rules of the universe and then break them yeah you don't really have rules of universe and um it's just nice that there's like another turn that you don't see coming yeah well we talked about the waiting room scene which is one of the most popular i think the next most famous scene has to be when uh they all dance to the banana boat song by yeah. harry belafonte also just the juxtaposition of the danny elfman score and then the only other music in it is a few harry belafonte songs 
and there just couldn't be more opposite. <laughs> and because of this movie, I always have the like notion that the Banana Boat song that Deo is like a scary song. Really? Because this is where I saw it, right? Because oh, I didn't become... Oh, like you see it as like a horror song. Yeah. Uh-huh. I didn't become aware of Harry Belafonte until I was like 25. I didn't really know him. I only knew the two songs he had in this. Hmm. And at the beginning of the movie, like right at the opening, you kind of hear like a ghostly echoey version of it. Right. Before yes. it gets into the main Beetlejuice song. So I always just associate it with like creepiness. Huh. So That's it's, funny. it's a, such a creepy song in this, but... It's the happiest song in the world. And I think that's just another layer of all of these really dissonant images coming together and always making you just kind of feel uneasy and not sure of like what is good, what is bad, because the ghosts are the good people, the people are the villains, and the afterlife is a waiting room. Everything is being turned on on its head. And they do that with the music as well. Did you like the Danny Elfman score? Yeah, I thought it was very appropriate. What else has Danny Elfman done? Every Tim Burton movie, Every pretty Tim much. Bur- okay, that's yeah. what I was going to say, because it felt very Tim Burton-y. He does do other things, like he did the first Spider-Man movie and things right. like that, which are departures. But if you listen to them, I remember when I was in the theater to see Spider-Man when I was a kid, and the main title started, and I was like, this kind of sounds like Danny Elfman a little bit. And then, of course, it was. was, But all of his Tim Burton stuff, the two of them just seem so perfect for each other. Like, they mesh really well. Because it seemed perfect for... Like, horror, but whimsical. When I was talking about German Expressionism, but a carnival, Uh if that had a sound, it's the theme to this. It's Danny Elfman doing Beetlejuice. Yeah, I agree. It's horror, but carnival. Yeah. Yeah, and I liked all the different, like, sound effects that they used in, like not appropriate places that made it seem very like unnerving and scary like when he grabs his crotch and it's a car horn yeah oh i didn't like i felt like that was like stupid humor but but i think beetlejuice was going for stupid humor yeah but there were some like noises throughout the house that happened i can't think of like an exact time but it was like noises that didn't belong in those moments which made the scene feel kind of unnerving I know there's a few like snake rattly type yeah. noises. Maybe that's kind of stuff like that. One of the things I thought was the most unnerving is when they go away to the afterlife and they come back and they're like, whoa, what is this place that we're in now? Yeah. And then they realize it's their own home. Yeah. That would be the scariest thing if you came into your home and you're like, what is this terrifying place? And then you realize that that's your home. Yeah. That sounds like actually scary to me. That does sound actually scary. And I, um, I enjoyed how, like, off kilter and out of, like, water they made the Maitland scene when they when they died and came back. Mm-hmm. And it was, like, you got that kind of discombobulated feeling that they were clearly trying to come to terms with. Oh, yeah. And when they go to the fire and her fingers light. <laughs> yeah. Like, you, you get that, like, what is happening kind of feeling that you can see on their faces the entire time. Oh, I guess I did start by saying, let's talk about that scene where they all dance. But I kind of digressed a lot. (laughs) So did you love that scene? It was fun. That's one of my favorites. And no, it's the most popular and everyone talks about it. But for good reason. It's fantastic. I Mm -hmm. love the choreography. I love that they are surprising themselves. Like the facial acting of all of the characters who were being forced to do the song and dance. Yeah. And every now and then they they let themselves get into it and it seems like they're really enjoying it but then they like fight against it a little bit but of course they can't win that fight yeah see because they're like possessed yeah and it was it was fun to watch like Catherine O'Hara when she realizes what she's doing Mm -hmm. because at the beginning she's like kind of like doesn't realize what's happening and then she kind of clues into what's happening and then she starts to fight it and she has such an expressive face that she was perfect for oh, that she, part. Oh, totally. She was hilarious in that scene. And then the um the party guests, um there's the one woman who just looks horrified the whole time. Mm-hmm. Like she's like what what is happening? Why am I doing this? How like undignified? <laughs> and then the other lady with the bow on her head is like kind of into it. <laughs> yeah. I loved uh, Otho when he grabs the like ice bucket and starts, and he playing starts it. like yeah because yeah. he closes his eyes at one moment 
and you don't like you think he doesn't kind of realize what he's doing and it's hilarious to watch him then all of a sudden start banging the drum and then realize what he's doing we didn't really talk about him but uh, otho is played by an actor named glenn shaddix who uh, passed away pretty young but he is great i really like him in movies that we already just talked about he was in heather's he is also the voice of the mayor in Nightmare Before Christmas. And there's a few other things that I think people are sure to know him from. But I think he was fantastic. And he can't be like my favorite character in this movie, but right. he's kind of my favorite character in this movie. <laughs> I thought he was so good in it. I found him like a little forgettable, but he definitely helped support the rest of the cast. Forgettable? Yeah, sorry. I thought he's many things. You could say like too over the top and you'd be like, yeah, I could see that. But I think it works because everything's over the top. But I definitely did not find him forgettable. I love Otho. And I kind of hate Otho, of course. But like, yeah, yeah, great that's performance. That's the point of his character, I think. Uh, one other person I did want to mention. Well, there was a Dick Cavett, who is a big time talk show host, is in it. Uh, Robert Goulet, the famous lounge singer who grew oh. up here in Edmonton, right, is in it as well. But uh, the actress who plays Juno is Sylvia Sidney, who many people may not know now, but in the 30s and 40s, she was the shit. She was like a bombshell. She was she got higher billing than Spencer Tracy in uh, Fury, that movie they were in. What? Yeah. <laughs> you you see, she's being sarcastic. I am being sarcastic. But that's actually a really big deal cuz Spencer looked Tracy so was so excited huge. while you were saying it too and I I don't know why I had to be mean. But <laughs> <laughs> well, cuz I I love a lot of those films yeah. from the late 30s and into the 40s that she was in. It's just like a classic Indian Sam moment. Yeah. <laughs> so I had seen a bunch of her stuff later when I was in my 20s mm -hmm. and then watched Beetlejuice at some point again and was looking at the credits and was like wait a minute Sylvia Sidney and I had no idea that it was the same person because mm -hmm. of course she's uh, quite old in this and she's also in Mars Attacks as well as like an elderly woman oh. and of course very different energy that she's giving off but very good in both of them did you like Juno? I did I um I thought she was kind of a fun way to introduce that world and i love when she smokes and it just kind of comes out of her slash yeah, neck that slash neck was hilarious <laughs> um they did such a good job at the makeup on her that it seemed like it made as much sense as smoke coming out of her mouth yeah because you're used to kind of after seeing a lot of the people and like miss argentina and stuff you, you're used to seeing kind of gruesome gory things on on the actors on the mm -hmm. characters and so yeah for some reason to me it didn't seem like weird or startling that she was smoking out of her neck <laughs> yeah when you have someone who is kind of flattened and on a rail on the ceiling being dragged around everywhere yeah. the slash neck doesn't seem so bad no it seems kind of normal one of the other big set piece scenes was the wedding one which was a lot of fun and you get Beetlejuice kind of literally turning things into a carnival when he mm. turns into one of those, I don't know, whatever you call that hammer smash game at carnivals, where you ring the bell with a hammer. It must have a specific name. Oh, yeah. Isn't it like a strengthometer? Sure. Strengthometer. Strengthometer. <laughs> uh, if you look very closely at one point, the top of one of those is like a skull and a bat, and it's a little Jack Skellington skull and a bat, and the next movie he would do would be Batman. Huh. And Nightmare Before Christmas wouldn't come out for another five years. Wow. I wonder if... Is Nightmare Before Christmas Tim Burton? Yes. It's not directed by him, but it's created by him. Okay, so I was going to say maybe he'd already been doodling Jack and like... Yes. Yeah. That's why Nightmare Before Christmas is a Disney movie, although it wasn't originally released as a Disney movie. He came up with the story and drew the characters while he was employed by Disney. Right, and Disney owns all your intellectual yeah. property Anything when you Anything you there. do, even if it's on your own time, if you're employed by Disney, Disney owns it. Right. So many years later, it was released. At the time, Disney did not back it at all and didn't put Disney's name anywhere on it. It then got really popular, and now it's And they're like, Disney's, oh, that's ours, that's ours, yeah. Christmas. yeah. Yeah, you can get... Like, lots of Nightmare Before Christmas stuff at Disney World. You couldn't back when it came No, out. and, like, I, that was some of the most popular merch, too. Yeah. Back to that wedding scene. <laughs> also, Robert Goulet and his wife are dead? They just get launched through the ceiling, never seen again. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. There was so much going on in that scene that, yeah, I guess they just didn't live anymore. 
<laughs> like that's a good way of saying it. Whenever someone dies and say like, yeah, they just didn't live anymore. <laughs> Do you remember in Edward Scissorhands, we kind of have this suburbia that is in constant conflict with Edward's world, which is all gothic and up on a hill mm-hmm. and scary. In this, we kind of get that as well, but rather than Tim Burton's fear of suburbia, we get his fear of, like, yuppies coming in and taking over everything. Gentrification. Yeah. yeah. Really, the villain of this movie is gentrification. Yes, for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, that was kind of neat um, because, like you said, in Edward Scissorhands, it's almost like they're, like, rejecting each other. Mm-hmm. And then in this movie, uh, the gentrification is kind of, like, forced inside the house it's it's the haunting of this movie because the ghosts are already there this house is haunted by by rich new yorkers and the deets reaction to the idea of ghosts is kind of similar to the reaction of connecticut Mm -hmm. they come to a place they take only what they want and they want to monetize it And they don't really realize what that thing is actually about. They Uh, make whatever they see what they want it to be. And, of course, they're unsuccessful. Well, kind of successful with the house, I guess, because they do design it the way they want. But they can't control those things. And you can't control everything. mm -hmm. Oh, I get it. (laughs) I had another one. Explain it to us. So this, this movie's all about, like, acceptance. Yeah. Right? It's about learning to accept the weird. Of course, Tim Burton would make a movie where the moral is accept the weird things and you're going to have a good time. Of course, acceptance is uh, difficult and it's most difficult when it revolves around death. But in this, first, the Maitlands don't accept the Dietzes and that's where they get into all their trouble mm-hmm. with Beetlejuice and everything like that. And then the Dietzes, of course, don't accept Connecticut for what it is. They want to turn it into the life that they had previously. Right. And they want to change everything. And in it turns out that they're the ones that need to be exercised from this, right? And Lydia seems to be the only one who's like kind of bridging those two worlds. Right. Because she's much more accepting of things. Because even though she comes from probably a great apartment in new york and has her whole life there yeah she's the one who says like yeah i could live in this house yeah and she's also then the only one who's able to see the ghosts because she's able to accept things as they are Hmm. and she doesn't even just see them as just ghosts she realizes very early on that no these are good nice people they're not some like hollywood construct of what a ghost is so she's able to see the truth a lot because she's the most uh, accepting of all of them. Hmm. You're very profound tonight. I try. And then you could even say, like, in that song we were talking about, they look like they're having fun a lot of the time. And it's when they just kind of like, you know, I'm just going to let, let it go happen, with it. Yeah. And eventually they do go for it and they think it's really fun. So the, if you just accept the weird things that are going on, mm-hmm. you're, you're going to have a good time. It's like life. Yeah. Just accept the weird, you're going to have more fun. Exactly. Exactly. And then in the end, everyone has accepted their new circumstances. The Dietzes are fine because they're like, yeah, now we don't have to parent. We can accept these uh, people living in Mm -hmm. our home. And the Maitlands are accepting of the Dietzes living there because like, well, now we have the child that we never got in in our normal lives. And uh, Lydia, of course, is getting the best of both worlds. And she has the parents that she always had, but she gets these new ones that are actually going to take an interest. And of course, in the end, in a Tim Burton movie, if you just accept everything that's weird and don't try to make it like the perfect thing that you'd envisioned, Mm -hmm. you accept all the the faults and strangeness along the way, and then you can be happy with it. (laughs) And everyone's happy at the end. So just accept the weird. I think is what Tim Burton would say. And it'll all be okay. Yeah. I like that. Because everyone in this movie is an outcast in in one way or another. Lydia is the most apparent in a lot of ways. Uh, The Maitlands are dead. They don't belong in that world anymore. The Dietzes have come to this new world that they don't belong to. And they've kind of been ostracized, it seems, a little bit from their old world. So Mm -hmm. everyone's a reject in some way. And then through the acceptance of all of this, whether it's acceptance of death or just each other and their quirks, they find like a happy life together. 
You made that like so nice and lovely. <laughs> yeah, so I think for all the fun and silliness and weirdness of this movie, which is still the best part, because usually you can say like, oh, this little message at the end is the best mm. thing. But no, the best part is all the surface stuff right. because it is so fun. I love the set design, the makeup, the characters, the music, everything like that. So any final thoughts on Beetlejuice? Um, I thought it was kind of an everything movie, if that makes sense. How so? I think uh, it was like sweet and there was like a little bit of romance. I think that it was kind of dark and twisty. I think it was like bright and zany and um, it kind of has a happy ending at the end. So I think that it's like kind of everything that you want to see in a movie. There you go. What bigger, <laughs> what better endorsement than it's everything you want to see in a movie. Yeah. We're going to put that on their next Blu-ray release. Perfect. It's everything you want to see in a movie. Yeah. Samantha, Samantha Hees. I love this. You should do. Yeah. The podcast. Yeah. I think this movie had so many things in it that it was uh, very fulfilling. I think the, like my biggest question is because I always want to see movies I love for the first time. Mm -hmm. Does this just shock? Like, not that it's shocking, but is it's jarring to get into? Or, like, how does it feel when you're seeing this bizarre movie for the first time? Bizarre is a good word. I felt very uncertain the entire time because I never really knew what was happening. Mm -hmm. It's like you go see, like, a rom-com and you kind of know that it's going to be romantic comedy throughout the entire thing. Or, like, you go see a horror movie and you're like, okay, this is going to be, like, creepy and scary throughout the whole thing. This had so many different facets that I, like, never really felt settled while watching it. But do you feel like that was advantageous because then the jokey parts are funny because they're not expected, the scary yes. parts are scary because yeah. they're not expected? Or do you feel more like... You're always trying to figure things out and then, like, don't really appreciate it as it goes. No, I think, like what you said, it kind of helped keep the mood light and not get, like, too bogged down in serious or too bogged down in comedy. You could have all those different facets and it didn't seem crazy that all of a sudden there was, like, a sweet romantic scene or mm -hmm. a crazy zany wedding. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're like, yeah, sure, why not? Okay, yeah. Again, and like just... you were saying, when he gets eaten by Sandworm at the end, you were just like, yeah, I don't know, it makes yeah, sense to me. Okay, cool. Even though it makes no sense. No, it makes no sense. But in the context of how this movie's been working, you're like, yeah, why not, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And it doesn't make me feel like, oh, what's going to happen next? Like, you're not annoyed by how quickly it changes direction. Because it's always changing direction. Because it's always changing direction. But it's not... Like some of those movies, like action movies, where you get like 1.2 seconds of each scene. Where we're like, we're, yeah, we're just like flashes between scenes. The reason I can't see 3D movies is because some of those scenes make me very motion sick because they're too fast. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this was like, it lets you sit in all the feelings for a little bit and then took you on to the next thing. I think you might be ready to go back to transcendental cinema. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see we'll see so indy do you have any final thoughts yes i think i've kind of formulated my idea about how this is just a haunted house movie but kind of upside down but it mm. follows ex the exact same beats so i always was pitching this as like a such a weird movie it's not like anything you've seen but then when you think about it it's exactly like every haunted house or like a horror movie but it in its plot points at least because in every one of those especially if it's based on a house mm -hmm. you start off with setting the scene and the house is usually really important if you're looking at uh, the shining you need all of those establishing shots of the overlook just as in this movie we get uh, the same thing but the opposite we get a lot of looks at the inside of their house but it's all happy it's bright none of that takes place at night they make sure that it's bright daylight all the time hmm. and then in all of those movies the family moves into this house and then there's some sort of warning or foreshadowing and usually the adults have to ignore it but the children see things it happens in the shining it happens in the exorcist it happens on house on haunted hill or the haunting 
they all have little things going weird in the house. And then the kid said, oh, I saw this. And the parents like, sure you did. Exact same thing happens here when they are trying to spook them out wearing the sheets. And Lydia says like, no, ghosts exist. Here's proof. And they're like, yeah, sure it does. Lydia. <laughs> and they just refuse to believe her, right? Yeah. And then they get into a point where they kind of accept the problem. Not accept it, but they acknowledge it. And that's usually when it's at like peak horror. When... Shelley Duvall realizes that, yeah, Jack is going crazy. When they realize Reagan is possessed, right, yes. you have all of that. And here in Beetlejuice, we have when they say, like, after the dance, they accept that, yes, there are ghosts. But, of course, they don't react in, like, hiring an exorcist. They want to monetize it. And in all of those movies, like... Uh, poltergeist they have to call in that tiny southern lady right you have to call an expert yeah that's in like all of these now that yeah. i think about it you always call an expert and i guess otho is the the exorcist no beetlejuice of course yes he's the bio exorcist yeah because they right call there. him yeah. to get rid of because their it's problem. reversed they call the ghost rather than calling the little southern lady from and he ends up being the problem yes yeah and then usually you get some sort of like possession in it when Jack gets possessed in The Shining, when the lady in Paranormal Activity is standing there for hours, it takes control of them. It um, takes the kid in Poltergeist. In this one, it's when all the yuppies summon them and they are at the will of the living, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a reversal of that again. And then you have to actually have the exorcism, which, of course, in The Exorcist is the exorcism, the burning down of the overlook, whatever you want to do. And here it's Beetlejuice who does, in fact, get rid of them. And in the finale, the supernatural force is banished because Ray... Oh, yeah. Spoilers for The Exorcist. <laughs> <laughs> we did do an episode on it last year. Go check it out. It's very good. I feel like you have to just accept that we're going to talk about it because we've already spoiled yeah. it on the podcast. So um, the next 20 seconds, I might spoil the ends of The Exorcist and The Shining. So at the end, of course, Reagan is fine and she's going to live a happy life. The hey, overlook what? burns down and uh, what's the little kid's name? Danny is fine. And they go on and they live in peace. And in these cases, those children have gone through something that mm -hmm. is then going to make them grow up more. Mm -hmm. Like Reagan is no longer a carefree child. She's been through all of this. Right. Danny, we even get a sequel and we learn what happens to Danny after. So he's messed up from all of this too. But this being a kind of inversion of all of these ideas, here it's about uh, protecting mm -hmm. or maybe even restoring Lydia's innocence because she's, of course, been saved from like being married to a like literal demon yeah. who's just the grossest. But also she's been uh, prevented from... Like a certain amount of cynicism, of uh, lack of faith in adults, in being jaded or cynical. And she kind of returns to childish concerns. Because at the end, what do we see her doing? Studying for tests, riding her bike, and dancing. Yeah. She never did any of those types of things before because she was like this jaded goth kid. And through this haunting, through this reverse haunting, she has done the opposite of growing up and she's kind of reverted to a state of innocence. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty good, Beetlejuice. I didn't, yeah. I didn't see all that oh, wow. before. This is profound. Yeah. I can't believe you ruined the end of The Shining and The Exorcist for me. <laughs> We've done episodes on both of them. You should check them out because I think it's some of our best stuff. I think so. The Exorcist for sure. Well, I think that wraps up everything I have to say about Beetlejuice. And thank you for uh, coming along that ride as I figured things out. Yeah. But I think, I hope that everything I was saying makes sense. It made sense in my mind. There was a lot of aha moments happening tonight. Yeah. Man, this movie's better than I thought it was. I love it. You should too. Oh, we should start a podcast called that. Let's do That's it. That's a good title. Well, before we leave for today... Let's thank our second sponsors. Yes. Uh, our second sponsor is one that you have heard from before. It is Pod Power, which is powered by the Edmonton Community Foundation. They are amplifying voices of local Edmonton podcasts that are doing uh, interesting stuff. So our podcast that we're going to talk about today is called Is This For Real? 
It's a podcast about various facets of black life in Edmonton. On the first season of the show, Breaking the Blue Wall, host Omar Salifu, I'm sorry if I butchered that, the host explores anti-black racism and policing and tells stories uh, about policing in schools, accountability in Alberta's policing system, and the impact of police violence on black Edmontonians. So if that sounds like something that you'd like to hear, you can listen to the podcast and read more about each episode at is this for real.ca. You can also support the work of these podcasters and future seasons on Patreon. Well, join us again next week where we will have two spoiler free reviews of things that we are into. Mm -hmm. And Samantha will let us know what our big watch will be for the week after that. And also, uh, go review and rate us because nobody does. We need it. We need it. I think it is something good for us. I'm not sure what. I think what it does is more people listen. And that's all we really want. Very true. We don't need money. I just want fame. Fame and fortune. I just want people to hear my hot takes on Beetlejuice. (laughs) (laughs) Um... This is this will be the last two episodes before we launch into spooky seasons. Oh yeah, so, all October we're going to do all spooky movies. Yeah, so I'm excited because this is always one of my favorite times um, because spooky things are your jam and not mine, so I'm trying to like ease into the world of scary movies. Um, okay, well, we'll see you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye. breathe not like that nope that's from the that's it <laughs> i got both in and out that time at the same time no like one after the other that's how i always breathe i always do one after the other first in and then out you just go in <laughs> yeah and then i talk all my air out uh, welcome to i love this you should too and we are podcast about some movies or some junk. We are brought to you from the Alberta Podcast Network, which is locally grown and community supported. Our guests today are roomy, but not guests. It's the, what's that word? Sponsorship. But I'm trying not to think, just talk and see how many things I can say without taking a breath. And then we're talking about Beetlejuice it's from 1988. It's directed by Tim Burton and stars Michael Keaton. It also has Gina Davis and Alec Baldwin and Winona Ryder and Jeffrey Jones and Sylvia Sidney and Catherine O'Hara. Wow! You got through the entire intro <laughs> to the podcast. We should just use that. That was all gold, right? Yeah, yeah that was perfect. <laughs>